Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the gift of the Scriptures. We give you thanks for the story and for what it has to teach us about how you see us. And we pray that as we think about it together, that you might be at work in our hearts, in our minds, in our hearing, and in our understanding. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I brought something with me today. So this is my favorite thing that we have in the office. So every time I see the label maker... I pretty much want to put a label on something. We bought this a couple years ago because I was tired of walking around the church and seeing all these janky labels everywhere that people had handwritten on stuff. And when we built this new building, I didn't want any of those kinds of labels on our stuff in here, right? We had fresh new stuff. We want it to be, you know, look clean and nice and be labeled properly. So I haven't been getting it out much lately, but... Every time Lisa leaves it lying around, I'm always tempted to find something to label. This is like a human impulse, and it begins very early on. You know, think about times when you've walked with a young person, a toddler, you know, who's just learning language, and they're pointing at things. What's this? What's that? Right? And you have to kind of label things for them. But before long, you go from labeling things to labeling people. By the time you get to high school, I don't know what the terminology was when you were coming up, you know, but in my time, like late 80s, early 90s, you know, the kids were, like you had the popular kids, you had the jocks, you had the nerds, right? You can guess maybe which ones I was. The skaters, the stoners, right? Um, You know, The language may change through time, but the idea of the labels is the same. We divide people up based on the labels that we hang on them. And once we label people, then we are making all kinds of assumptions, especially when we talk about kids. We're making all kinds of assumptions about their past and their present and their future. And one of the things that I think schools are increasingly aware of is how damaging this can be to kids when you hang these labels on them at a young age. So I was reading a blog by an educator who was talking about the idea of kids being kind of like uh, wet cement, you know, it's poured in the neighborhood and kids are tempted to come by and kind of etch their names on it. And kids' hearts are kind of like that, right? You put that label on and They're soft enough that that label will stick. But as they grow up, you know, those words that get carved on there kind of calcify. And then they're really hard to remove. They're just stuck. What are the labels that people have hung on you? What are the labels that you've hung on yourself through time? Have you ever tried to remove them? It's not an easy thing to do. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes a lot of practice in trying to learn new behaviors and stop acting out of those labels. And you need people around you who will understand how difficult it is to stop living out of those labels. It's important work, though. And it's important for us to remember that all those labels that we put on ourselves and on each other, they all have consequences, and they all have costs. And that's true even in the sense when a label may be positive. We may think of it as a a positive thing that we're saying about someone. Those labels still can affect us on these really deep spiritual and emotional and psychological levels. Because they create limits on how we see ourselves. And they also create limits on how other people see us. Limits that become hard for us to transcend or live beyond. You know, this educator was talking about in the blog, the idea that kids will either live up to the labels or live down to the labels, depending on how you look at it. 
main character in today's gospel lesson isn't known by her name. Really, she's only known by her label. And this is the label that she's worn for the past 2,000 years. The woman caught in adultery. That's how we talk about this story. It's the story about the woman caught in adultery. You know that story? It's familiar to us. It's one that we love. Theologians will refer to it constantly when they're talking about Christ's mercy and what that looks like in our lives. And we think about it frequently when we imagine how we hope that we might be judged, either by God or by the people around us. We think about this story. So one of the things you might be surprised to learn is that the oldest manuscripts of John's gospel don't have this story anywhere in it. In fact, when you look at it in its original language, when you look at it in the Greek, the language of the New Testament, what you find is that stylistically, this little story is very different from the rest of John's gospel. And in fact, it only begins to show up in manuscripts of John in like the 5th century. Strangely enough, sometimes it even shows up in old copies of Luke, Same text, in a different place. And so for that reason, in many Bibles, this little passage is bracketed, usually with a note that says something like, this passage not found in the most ancient manuscripts. And yet we love it. There's still other ancient theologians and ancient documents that hint that they know the story. Even if it wasn't in texts that we are able to find that go back further, there are people still talking about it like they know the story, as though it was circulating independently. It was that important, that it was just this free-floating story about Jesus that people told to each other. For example, St. Augustine was born in 354 A.D., He defends it as being authentic and says you can trace its history back to somebody uh, who lived right around 100 A.D. Some biblical scholars in trying to understand, you know, well, if this story is so important, if it seems to us to capture something that's really important about who God is and who Jesus is, They try to figure out why wasn't this included in the Gospels? Why wasn't it part of the stories that we told from the beginning? Well, some people imagine that maybe the fear was that this particular story would give license to adulterers. That that was something that the church was so opposed to that it was dangerous to include this story in the Gospel. Which kind of makes sense because... For every person everywhere, in every comment thread that I've ever read, anywhere, on Facebook, whatever, where somebody invokes this story and talks about how Jesus promised forgiveness, there is somebody guaranteed, 100% guaranteed, in that same thread who will be quick to add, yes, but he also tells her, go and do not sin again. Every single time. So even after being offered forgiveness by Jesus himself, which is, after all, the point of the story, this poor woman still cannot shed her label. She still can't. And in fact, this whole passage, you might talk about it as people trying to hang labels on one another. Why do the legal experts even provoke this confrontation with Jesus? Well, it's because they want to hang a label on him. Because they want to be able to set him aside. They want people to ignore him. If you can label him, you can ignore him. And if you can ignore him, you can pretend like he's not really human. Like he's not a real person. And then later on, when it comes time to kill him, it's real easy to do away with them. So I'm not 100% sure what they're aiming for here. Maybe heretic. 
maybe fraud, maybe, you know, denier of the law, maybe even just something like bleeding heart. I don't know. But in that sense, this whole episode is not radically different than the political or the religious kind of litmus tests that we subject one another to all the time. Because, God forbid, we find that we cannot put a label on someone, that their views don't fit neatly into a category that we figured out. We don't know what to do with them. I remember when I was in seminary, I applied for a position at a church in a denomination that will remain nameless. I applied for this position, and the job was to play music for the youth group. Wednesday night, I'd show up, play some music, lead some songs. They'd pay me 50 bucks. Easy gig. I needed the money. I showed up at the interview. The first question that they asked me was my position on abortion. Clearly, they were on the lookout for certain types of Christians. I did not last super long in the job. We love labels because we think that they're useful, because we think that they're going to get us somewhere. They asked me the question because they thought that that was going to help provide some insight. But the problem is when we think they can tell us something about someone, we are misled because it takes work to understand people. And when we try to take a shortcut through a label, we fail to do the work. We've cut off the relationship. And that's the danger when we apply labels to others is they get in the way of the work that it takes to really understand someone. They get in the way of the real connection and the real relationship. But I want to come back to the woman in the story because my point today is not necessarily about the labels that we hang on others, though that's important. I'm more interested in the labels that we allow others to hang on us and the labels we hang on ourselves and how they affect us. For thousands of years, the woman in this story has only been known as the woman caught in adultery. Think about how terrible that is. To have your story immortalized in the religious texts of a tradition that literally has billions and billions and billions of adherents. And the only way that you're known is that as the woman caught in adultery. I'm wondering if you think about your worst day if you think about the day where you were at maximum shame, if you think about the day that you were at maximum embarrassment because of something that you had done. Now, this is not an idle question. This is not a rhetorical question. I actually want you to think about that day. And I understand, recognize that it might be painful to think about that day. But I want you to go back to that time and consider for a second what label would you have hung on yourself in that day? What would you have said about yourself? And now I want you to take it one step further. And I want you to think about the idea that what if that was the label that you had to wear for all time. What would that be like? Now, I'm guessing that for some of us, that exercise was not that difficult. I mean, difficult in the sense that it might be painful, but not necessarily difficult in the sense that maybe you immediately went to it, went to that label, because you actually think that thing of yourself all the time. 
that you never get away from it, in fact. I'm sure that some of you wake up in the morning with that thought in your head. But what I want you to hear today is this. I don't care if there is someone or something that continually wants to remind you of that label, that wants to remind you of that mistake, that wants to remind you of that sin, who wants to force you to kind of relive it over and over. I want you to hear something. And I want you to hear it clearly because it's not me talking, but it's Jesus talking. It's not the preacher, but it's God talking through these words of this passage. Is there no one to condemn you? then neither do I condemn you. The one who made you does not allow any human-made label to define you, and neither should you. I don't care who it is that tries to hang that label on you. It is just not accurate. Think about it this way. Isn't it true that the inventor of a thing gets to name that thing. That's how the world works, right? You invent something, you get to decide what it's called. The one who made you and the one who saves you doesn't call you by that thing you call yourself. I guarantee that. Never has, never would, never will. Instead, the one who made you and the one who saves you calls you by only one thing. Mine. Mine. Beloved, forgiven, mine. That's who you are. So children of God, don't allow anybody to hang any other name on you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you that we do not have to be defined by our worst day. But instead that we are defined by what you have done for us and by what you called us. We give you thanks that you have called us forgiven and beloved. We thank you that you have called us your children. Amen.